My name is Christian Ashley, a seminary student and servant of God, and you are listening to the Let Nothing Move You podcast, a proud Anazal Ministries podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to the next episode of the Let Nothing Move You podcast. I'm your host, Christian Ashley, as we continue on through the book of Exodus. But real quick, we do have some announcements as far as other shows, as far as guests. Um, as mentioned earlier, I am going to be... I have already uploaded, sorry, uh, Friday Night Frights, which is a once a month thing that Joe Day of Buddy Walking uh, with Jesus and I do, where we discuss, you know, the paranormal, cryptozoology, ufology, and a lot more. And we do that, like I said, once a month on the Systematic Ecology YouTube page, but now it's going to be in podcast form if you guys prefer that. As well, there's going to be a new show added to the Anazal Ministries podcasting network that, of course, being some joyful noises where we would have a myriad of people talking not only you know Christian music, but also music in general. Uh, I will be on there my first episode uh, that really just kind of I'll upload more as I just kind of feel led to. Uh, my first episode will be on Jesus Freak, the titular song of the Jesus Freak CD of DC Talk and my review of it. So there's that. Well, so without any further ado, we're going to be heading into Exodus into chapters 33 through 36. And I know that sounds like a lot, but we're going to get through them all. It's going to be fine. We're going to be starting in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 33. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. We see here, God's words are a test to his people. He guarantees them success in everything that they're about to do. He's guaranteeing them success in taking over the land with a caveat. He won't be with them. Now, if the Israelite people were a fully stiff-necked people, they would have taken God up on the offer. But they had just learned from the golden calf incident. And they were committed at this time not to make the same mistakes. They knew that going off without God would mean certain death, even with temporary successes. For once, the people pass God's test and they humble themselves before him. Now, how can we do the same with the test that God offers us? Do we resist the desire to do things on our own, or do we submit to him? Now, if you've been following us this entire time, you'll know we've been through the book of Romans. And recall what happens to people who God leaves to their own devices. As we looked at earlier in Romans 1, 21 through 25, this time in the NIV, where Paul writes, For Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. That's where God leaves you when you say no to him. And why would anyone be angry? I mean, he gave you exactly what you wanted. He gave the Israelites exactly what they wanted. Every single time they turned away from him. But when they came back and repented and knew that they had been foolish, he brought them back into the fold. And this test right here was a part of that. He had to see, are they committed to me? He knew that they would say yes. But he had to make them aware that they would say yes. I would go from there to verses 7 through 11. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which is outside the camp. 
Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would ascend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Now, this tent of meeting was incredibly important, not only between Moses and God, but also for Moses and the people. It was also very far from the people, showcasing their distance from God and how far they had to come in order to seek him out which meant that they had to be committed to doing so in order to get what they asked for. It's not like what we have now. You don't need someone like me to represent you and say, all right, Lord, this is what the people are saying. No, you don't, you don't need Moses. You don't need your pastor. You don't need your priest. You need God. And what a great gift we have. We don't have the same distance. But for them in this spot, this is where Moses and God would speak with one another as Joshua would learn under them. Don't just skip over that part at the end there. Joshua is learning under Moses how to serve God, because guess what? Moses ain't going to live forever. So you need to have someone to take over for you. And Joshua is going to spend 40 some years doing this so that when it is his time to lead the people into the promised land, he's as prepared as possible. Now, we look at the people's response to witnessing the presence of God descending upon the tent. And what was it? What was their response? To worship. That's what they needed to do. That's what they had been failing to do this whole time. They were immensely blessed to see a physical manifestation of God among them. Now, we don't have the same luxury. Not because God doesn't deem us worthy of his presence, but because we don't require it like they did. Recall that they saw this every single day and still would grumble, complain, and rebel over the 40 years that they're going to be in the desert. If God were to do the same to us, our excuses for not following after him would be even more hollow than they already are. These people don't have Jesus. We do. So when we're thinking about this again, let us be mindful of this whole scenario and what we have and what God allows us to do the next time we resist his will and what we know to be right. They had no excuse, and we certainly have no excuse, we who have far more information than they ever could have understood and comprehended at the time. And yet we make the same mistakes, those same, sorry, intentional choices to not listen. Now, we see here that God also speaks to Moses personally as if he were speaking to a friend, because Moses is his friend. Can you hear that? A human being created by the same God is God's friend. What an immense, like, encapsulation of Moses' character that someone like God would call him a friend. Later on, we get someone like David, someone who is after God's own heart. You don't think he's going to be friendly with him? Don't think God is going to be friends with, you know, Peter and Paul and all that they did. But guess what? Your status doesn't matter when it comes to God. God, if you are his, is your friend. Now, it's possible that, you know, God speaking face to face with Moses, you know, maybe he appeared in a humanoid form, you know, as he did to Abraham. But the far more likely explanation was that Moses was able to see enough of God as spirit for them to hold these conversations. Now, even though they were speaking face to face, Moses still hadn't managed to see the totality of God, and thus was not burnt to cinders for being a sinful man in the presence of God's fullness. And we'll go from there to verses 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. 
And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I, and I know your by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Uh, real quick, uh, I forgot to mention uh, guests, by the way, like I promised to do earlier. Uh, for As we get into the book of Leviticus heading on, uh, Joshua Noel of the Whole Church Project has, has pretty much claimed almost the entire book himself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only half joking about that. Uh, he will be with us in Leviticus 1 to 2. Uh, we will also be having uh, Brandon Knight returning and uh, Karai Ro will be returning. I'm trying to see where Pastor Will wants to come on. Uh, he's got a very busy schedule, so I won't blame him if he's not able to do anything. But yes, uh, Nick will not be able to join us. He's incredibly busy uh, these next couple of weeks and months. So yeah, just... Prayers for him on everything that he has to do, because the man's, like I said, a very, very busy man. So in regards to the verses I just read, Moses once more intercedes for the people, begging God to reverse his decision to not go before them, which he does, God having always intended to do so. Moses then asks to see God's glory which God offers to his servant as a further show of his agreement to go with the people to the promised land. And we'll get into that a little more later on. But what we see here is that the honest and earnest prayers of a disciple who wishes to follow the will of God made this possible. Had Moses asked for something else to occur, God would have been angry. But because he knew his God, Moses prayed in alignment with God's will so that the people could all be blessed as a result of his many prayers for their sake and his own. God didn't want to abandon his people. Moses knew that. But Moses also knew if no one prayed for them, well, it wouldn't be God's fault if he abandoned them because they did nothing to reach out to him. So Moses stepped up for them and did that for their sake and his own. But we also see Moses didn't leave things here. He wished to experience more of the fullness of God and asked to see God's glory. Now, the Hebrew word used here for your glory is kebodeka, which is a form of kabod, itself a derivative of kabod, which can translate as weight. So in essence, Moses is asking to be weighed down by the presence of God to the point where God is undeniable and Moses feels it constantly. That is a beautiful prayer. Don't you want to feel God's presence beside you? Not in a, an oppressive weight, but a loving one, one that you know you're surrounded. It's like wearing, you know, just be a little simple and childish about this, wearing a Snuggie. It's like, it's enough to where you're warm and protected, but there's enough of a weight where it's not afflicting you. It's enough to keep you protected. Now for us, it's not simply enough to, to speak with God and thank him for what he does to us. Those are good. Don't get me wrong. We should be doing those things. But if we truly seek him, we must hunger for every opportunity to experience him. This isn't greed but an honest desire to be with him and never leave his presence. Now, admittedly, I'm very bad at doing this myself, and it's definitely something I can work on more in my personal walk with him. So I say that as a bit of encouragement to you. Hey, I don't got it all together. Imagine that. And if you think I had this whole time, I don't know what I could have been saying differently. I think I'm big, one of the biggest screw-ups in the world. And yet, he still clings to me. 
And yet I still, when I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, when I'm seeking after him, I feel that weight around me. And it is a very comforting weight. For God's yoke is light. Now, what does God do in response to Moses' question? He answers his child, not by showing his power, his wrath, his intellect, or his mercy, but by showing his goodness. His to be, in the original Hebrew, to Moses. God has all of those earlier aspects, but to not understand his goodness means that we fail to understand why he's capable of those other aspects of himself. His wrath and his mercy make no sense without God revealing that he himself is good and cannot abide evil. God is an inherently unbalanced being, and that's good, because he is a being full of goodness and no evil. 100% of one, 0% of the other. That's unbalanced, people would say. Well, that's good. I don't want a God who has evil in his heart. That makes no sense. None of what he does in these scriptures makes sense if God is evil in any way, shape, or form. There is no yin and yang or shades of gray with his character. God is good. And because of that, Moses is able to see that. Now, you also see here, as a part of his character, that God is gracious to who he's going to be gracious to. And he's going to show mercy on who he shows mercy to. Now, people say, well, that's unfair. Yeah. I don't know. If you've been following along for any time, you know my belief, the truth, I would argue immensely, that God is unfair. And that's good for you and me. And that's good for everyone he shows favor to, everyone he shows mercy to, everyone he shows his graciousness to, because it's not deserved. There's never been a single moment in my life where I have ever earned anything. God has gifted me. Moses definitely didn't deserve anything here. And so do I. Yet. God gave it because he decides upon whom to give mercy, upon whom to be gracious. And it is a wonderful and beautiful thing. But keeping all that in mind, Moses still couldn't see all of God because he himself is an imperfect human being full of sin. Who, by the way, under the sacrificial system, which hasn't been fully implemented yet, can only be covered, not taken away. Now, his earlier talks with God had never been done in the fullness of his presence. And even give Moses a small amount of what he had asked for, God had to prepare, prepare very specific circumstances for Moses to see him passing by and for Moses not to die. Even still, Moses could only see God's back, his ahore, which, if I remember correctly, is the only time that word is used in Scripture. We're not entirely sure what the significance of it is, why is back, but it's heavily implied. The best Moses could hope to see of God's holy presence was his back turned to the prophet, for anything else would mean death. And what an immense gift it was just to see God's back. How many of us can say that? I know I can't. I've never seen it. And yet God offered that because his servant asked for it in knowing fullness of where God's will was. And we go from there to chapter 34, verses 1 through 9. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain, Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of, uh, tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and he proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands. You may Some of your translations may say thousands. Sal, oh goodness gracious, that lisp. Sal, ugh. I hope you're laughing with me. Thousandth generation for forgiving 
excuse me, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth in worship. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Thank you for sticking by me through my inability to read very simple words. <laughs> that lisp, every now it comes out, and it just kind of sucks. It is what it is. So we see here, God commanded Moses to make another set of tablets for the commandments to be written on them because they were still important and the people still needed them as evidenced by their earlier apostasy. And through this, God describes his character to Moses, revealing more of himself than any of the patriarchs of old had known, showing what we've already seen and more in that he is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for hundreds of generations or thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but also delivering justice to the guilty and to those who follow in their footsteps in the family line. Let's look at these briefly for a moment. I'm not going to go into all the stories here and the, the entire history. We don't have time for it. But God has done all these things and more. How is God merciful? Well, I would call God very merciful for offering Jesus Christ on the cross instead of my own merit. Because as we'll get through through Leviticus, I ain't good enough. And I'm never going to be. But God in his mercy offered an unfair way out of what we rightfully deserve. How is God gracious? There are many examples. I'm just going to use this one of saving Paul from himself. For those of you who've read your Acts, you see Paul, also Saul, persecuted Christians. If there was any man who deserved not to be gods, it's one who is actively fighting against him to the point where he is jailing them and causing them to die. But God, in his graciousness, reached out to Paul on the road to Damascus and gave him the ability to see him for who he truly was. How is God slow to anger? Well, that's going to be an unpopular opinion in some circles, and I don't really care. Because God is slow to anger and giving the people of Canaan hundreds of years to repent before offering his wrath via the invasion of the promised land. It, people would say God is some tr trigger-happy God. It's like, the moment you sin, well, it's time to go to hell. It's like, that's not how he works. God is so patient and slow to anger. He gave these people knowing they wouldn't repent, knowing they would never turn to him time they didn't deserve and would never deserve because he is slow to anger. And yet people get angry when God acts out in his anger. Because, oh, now it's affecting me. Or, oh, God's just being unfair. They don't understand them. So no wonder they're angry because they don't understand his anger. How is God abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness? Well, just read through the history of Israel. There's more. Just I'm just talking scripture at this point in time. God looks upon his bride, the people of Israel, this faithless bride that never once remained wholly committed to him. And he allowed them to be taken out of the land yet because of his steadfast love, excuse me, yeah, and faithfulness, he brings them back to the land and becomes their God once more. As we see in Ezra and Nehemiah, these wonderful books of the Bible of God's steadfast love and faithfulness. And as well, how does God keep steadfast love for hundreds and thousands of generations? Look at the history of the Jewish people beyond Scripture. Is there any other people group in the world who have been displaced from their land? They didn't leave by choice, and yet they maintain their identity for the most part. They maintain their language for the most part. They maintain their Scriptures and were then brought back to that land. That is not a human possibility that does not exist without God. It is impossible from a human standard for those people to maintain their cultural identity and then be given back the land they lost 2,000 years before. That's love. 
How does God forgive iniquity and transgression and sin? Multiple times over. But for a second, we'll just focus on David. David, a man after God's own heart, still a sinner. Sins against God, sins against Bathsheba and her husband Uriah by bringing her over to him. They have a child through that union, and that child dies. More should have been offered. David should have died. But God forgave, and God protected. You can argue about the baby all along. The baby's an innocent guess. But it's also an image bearer God created that he can do whatever he wants with. Don't tell the potter what to do with the clay. You can be angry. That's fine. I don't like the fact that a baby died. But what I do love is that God saw a sinful man who was repenting, and then he forgave him. How does God deliver justice to the guilty and those who follow in the footsteps in their family line? Well, just look at Ahab's family, king of Israel, a wicked man bringing the prophets of Baal in, slaughtering the prophets of God under the directives of Jezebel, his wife. And how does God deal with him? Has him killed in battle in an unkingly manner. Jezebel is, mur is not murdered, is killed for her actions. Jehu rises up under God's leadership, kills off the members of Ahab's family, except for the part where they had intermarried with the kingdom of Judah. So we have Athaliah. How does God deal with her? She dies as she's supposed to. Despite everything she does, despite what her son Ahaziah does, despite what his son Jehoash does, originally working with God, but then the priest that he works with dies and he looks away from God. Then we get to Amaziah. And he continues on in wickedness, and he too dies because of his sin. How many generations is that? Four to five, depending on who you're asking. God brought justice to every single one of them. And I know I, that's a little Cliff Notes version of what actually happened to them. But that's who God is. God doing a single one of these things, bringing a single one of these aspects of himself as a bountiful gift we don't deserve. I don't deserve God's mercy. I don't deserve God's grace. I don't deserve God's love. If he only chose to show love and not mercy, God is still good. But he doesn't work like that. He offers every single one of those things as a bountiful gift we don't deserve. He has never been under any rule or regulation to where he has to offer these things to us. Yet he gives of these things and more abundantly to his people and to those who will never say yes to his call to repent and turn to him. <laughs> This is the merciful and loving God that we preach. Never let anyone tell you the God of the Old Testament is a wrathful and evil being compared to the God we see in the New Testament. I brought up examples from both Testaments. You know why? Because it's the same God. That very God is the same in both utilizing these aspects of himself to bring justice and punishment to those who act against them while showing endless, faithful, steadfast love to those who are his. And in light of all that I just said earlier about how God just described himself to Moses, Moses humbly asks God to be with them and to forgive them. For all his many faults, Moses is a good leader and one that we should all emulate. If I am not doing the same for the people under my charge, then I am a worthless leader. A good leader prays for his people and asks God to look after them and forgive them of their sins, just as that leader prays the same for themselves, for they are just as sinful and lost without the holy presence of God in their lives. Moses got that. A good leader will do that. Good pastors that I've had in the past, I know they have prayer journals. I know that they are constantly praying for other people, even when you're no longer a member of their flock. Because I've had that happen to me. I've had pastors mention, hey, you were on my mind today. I was praying for you. And I have not attended their church in very long. Yet they were doing it anyways. Because they love me and they love God. So why don't I do the same? Why don't we do the same? And we'll go from there to verses 10 through 17. And he said, behold, I am making a covenant. Before all your people, I will do marvels, such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among you who are whom you are shall see all this good, goodness gracious and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you 
Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down the ashram. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of its sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and your daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods, you shall not make for yourself any god, gods of a cast metal. Yeah, some harsh language used there. But it's God. I don't get to argue against it. He's right. But before that, God makes a further covenant with Israel, one in which they are very much unequal partners in, as God knows their future hearts and yet still offers it out of his mercy and love. He promises to do a wondrous and amazing things for their sake, and he delivers on those promises in an incalculable way, offering them far beyond whatever they deserve. The blessings he offers them are far beyond what they can even fathom. And he offers them anyways. In light of this promised covenant, God commands the Israelites to refuse the snare of the Canaanites. Whether it's through treaties or worshiping their gods, both the things that will actually happen later on. God knowing what would happen still says no to it. Still tells them not to do it because then they have no excuse. They make a pact with the Gibeonites. They end up not conquering the entire land and intermarrying with the Canaanites. And who lead them to sin? It's like God knew what he was talking about. Because he is asking this because he is a jealous, a kana God. Every time that word kana is used in scripture, it refers to God's feelings of desiring to be the only one that Israel seeks after. Nowhere else is this used except in reference to God and his feelings of being owed Israel's love because of who he is. This is not a human jealousy where we desire the affections of others that we haven't earned. But this is the holy jealousy of God who deserves our affections and more because he imbues us with life, saves us from ourselves, and is the only one we can rely on to truly love us. These idols can't do that. Your friends can't do that. Your spouse can't do that. A nation can't do that. Your politician can't do that. Only God can do this for us. And because of that fact, God reiterates his earlier command to never make idols, specifically to point out the Israelites making the golden calf earlier. This was no doubt still fresh in their minds and serves as a great tool to remind them of their past failures, while also reminding them that they were still alive because of God's patient love for them. And we go there to 18 through 25, excuse me, 18 to 26. You shall keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you, at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For in the month of Abib you came out from Egypt. All that open the womb are mine, all your male livestock, the firstborn of cow and sheep, the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days before you, excuse me, six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. You shall observe the feast of weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will cast out nations before you and enlarge their borders, excuse me, enlarge your borders. No one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in a year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leaven, or let the sacrifice to the feast of the Passover remain until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. The Feast of Unleavened Bread serves as a reminder of what God had done for them in Egypt and for the people to consecrate their firstborn to him, sacrificing animals as needed to show their devotion to him. It's not the first time this has shown up in Exodus alone. It's not the last time it's going to be mentioned. So when something gets repeated, I tend to think it's kind of important. And we're going to see that had Israel listened to these commands, they never would have feared invasions and strife during these times, these times specifically, for God had promised to allow them to celebrate these holy days. But 
because they hardly ever held to his laws and statutes, they suffered during what should have been a time of celebration and rest. And they had no one to blame but themselves. And let's also look here to the repeated command, don't sacrifice blood with anything leaven, because that defeats the purpose of what that is supposed to be doing. If you have the leaven there, that symbolizes sin. Don't do that. We've already been over that before. We'll probably do it again, if I remember correctly. We also have another repeated command here, one that I brought up earlier when it was, and that's the law against boiling a goat in its mother's milk. Now, earlier, I talked about the cultural reasons they weren't supposed to do this. But I think I did you all a disfavor by not making this applicable to you as I did so. While the historical and cultural reasons for why this was made a law are interesting, I mean, they really don't apply to us in the same way. I, I mean, at least I, I've never been around when this has been done. I don't think anyone else listening has done this. And if you have, I'd be interested to hear your story. But the ultimate point in what God was saying here is that we should never rely on rituals, magic, and superstitions to help us out in life. For that's exactly what this was. So instead of those things, we're supposed to rely only on him. Now, in our more modern age, things like you know, astrology and our beliefs and our political parties give us a false hope that we can discover and prepare for the future. Astrology offers false assurances of our character and what blessings we can expect for simply being born under a specific time of the year or specific star or planet, what have you. Politics, meanwhile, offers us false assurances of safety and security as promised by those we align with in our beliefs. Both of these are foolish to place hope and trust in as they do not originate from God but from man who has never once led themselves to truth and security unless God is behind them. So my call to you is to avoid placing your faith in these shiftless things of man, but instead look to the God who can provide us with all we need if only we turn to him. We'll go to verses 27 through 35. And the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote in the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Moses and all the people of Israel saw, excuse me, Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with them. Now we see here, once more, Moses is commanded by God to write all these things down. This is no mere coincidence that this is a repeated command, because this is done for the sake and benefit of the people that they might have these rules written down in their own language, in something that's a lot more sturdier than something made out of papyrus. It was also for Moses' benefit as well, as we have no textual signs that he himself possessed an eidetic memory, and thus would need to turn to what he had written down under God's directives to refresh his memory when it came to displaying the laws to the people. And even if he were to memorize these laws, like we would see many priests and eventually the Pharisees do, the written down laws help prevent misremembering and intentional perversions of the law, as the stone tablets were not as easily misconstrued and malleable as the human mind. That is why, when we look at this, through every scrap that we have left behind of what's come before, the Dead Sea Scrolls, when it comes to the Gospels as well, they agree with each other. There may be small typological errors, one word used incorrectly, that's human fault not God. And even if that happens, it doesn't make the scripture itself invalid. But Moses does this to prevent these things from happening. And more importantly, to listen to what God tells him to do. But we also see here 
that Moses being in God's presence has allowed him to shine brightly in a physical manner, as no doubt a soul was doing the same. Moses had been preserved by God in these moments, both spiritually and physically, as it is impossible for the human body to survive 40 days without water. Yet God did it to strengthen his chosen instrument for the sake of Moses and for the sake of the people. But the shining that came from this time with God allowed the people to know of God's favor towards Moses and to remain as one more physical sign that God himself was with them. We also notice here, Moses wasn't aware initially of this change because he himself was far too humble to expect to be worthy of such a reward. And Moses had not asked for this gift, but God offered it anyways, always going above and beyond what his people deserve. Now, remember this alongside the pillar of cloud and smoke, as well as the pillar of fire throughout the rest of the Pentateuch, when the people and Moses sin and rebel. Having just one of these was a blessing. To have all three was far beyond what was called for. Also, don't forget the manna, by the way, so four. And yet God offered them freely. And for this, the people would still choose to resist his call for them to be his own. Don't ever think, if I had been there, things would have been different. (laughs) I'd have been on God's side the whole time. You know, we're pretty tight. But no, we would have been just as bad. And yet God was still loving. Now, in regards to this fail, I actually had to do a lot of work on this one. So uh, I was learning along with you guys. We see something immensely interesting in how Moses was intentionally not allowing them to see his face to prevent the people from understanding that this covenant of theirs was finite. As Paul points out in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 13 through 15 in the NLT, we, Christians, are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so that they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand. Guess what? Moses did not know Jesus Christ. He predicted him coming, but he did not know him as his personal savior. So he knew in his heart of hearts that even though this covenant existed and it was for the good of the people, and even though it was delivered by God, It wasn't good enough. So the veil was a sign of him knowing this in his heart. He knew the law was never meant to be the final say in the matter between the people and their relationship with God. But he also knew it was not his place to say anything. So he remained in humbleness. And some people would even argue out of fear, which I could understand, for the sake of the people. Moses knew that eventually the shine on his face would pass away when he did, just like the law one day would pass away when Jesus came to fulfill it for our sake. Also, it paled in comparison to the true glory of God, whose shine can never fade from his face like it can with mortal man. That's amazing, isn't it? To see that, to witness that. And then to understand, because if you just get this face value, which what I would originally have taken it as, just to be honest with you, it's like, oh, Moses is just being humble. Like, no, Paul, being smarter man than I, sees something there that I missed. He's hiding that face, not only out of humbleness, but also because he knows that glory isn't going to last under the covenant, under the law, because it's not good enough to save them. We don't have that problem. God's glory is displayed proudly in our faces when we do his work, because we have nothing to hide. We have salvation. We have him. And we go from there to chapter 35, verses 1 through 3. Moses assembled all the congregation of the people of Israel and said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. Six days' work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire in all your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. Now, these rules are simply further explanations on what the people can and can't do on the Sabbath. No doubt someone may have, war- may have wondered what if they'd be sinning if they did any of these things on the day. So God, knowing their hearts, 
offered further insights into the rules so that they could avoid sinning against him as death would be the requirement for their sin and no sacrifice could cover them. The punishment was immediate and swift. Verses 4 through 19. Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tan ram skins, and goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and the bre- for the breast piece. Let every skillful craftsman among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded, the tabernacle, its tent and its covering, its hook and its frames, its bars, its pillows and its bases, the ark with its poles, the mercy seat and the veil of the screen, the table with its poles and all its utensils and the bread of the presence, the lampstand also for the light with its utensils and its lamps and the oil for the for the light and the altar of incense with its poles and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense and a screen for the door at the door of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering, with its grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its strand, and its stand, sorry, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases, and a screen for the gate of the court, the pegs of the tabernacle on the pegs of the court and their cords, the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priests. Now, for the next couple chapters, as we finish off Exodus, we're going to get some repetition here. God had earlier commanded Moses to do these things and how they were supposed to be done, and now he delivers these directives to the people. Like I said, these words are very repetitive, but they were important to God as he commanded them for for them to be written down, so they should be important to us as well. And I say this in light of how I'm going to be resisting instincts in my head as I'm going to be finishing off these chapters next time in the next episode. Because a lot of it is the same as what we read before. But there's a purpose behind it, and I need to get my heart right as I read it. And I would suggest you do the same. Now, we see here, God asking those who have a willing heart to commit to these commands. God desires true worship and relationship with us. In the same way, we don't desire to have wishy-washy and flaky friends. God desires disciples who earnestly seek him and wish to love him. As Jesus says in Revelation 3, verses 15 through 16 in the New Century Version, I know what you do, that you are not hot or cold. I wish that you were hot or cold. But because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am ready to spit you out of my mouth. That's so harsh language, Christian. Well, pfft. Don't argue with me, it's Jesus. Failure to take our roles as disciples and servants seriously offends the bringer of life, and any punishment we get from our lukewarm devotion is completely our fault. There's no God, this is on you. No, it is on us. Are we for him or are we against him? As we're going to see for this time, the people were for him, and they were rewarded for it. The same is true of us. We are his. The rewards he offers are endless. Even in the midst of strife, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of suffering, his rewards are endless. I'll go from there to uh, verses 20 through 35. Then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him, and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the holy garments. So they came, both men and women. All who were of a willing heart brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and armlets, all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicated an offering of gold to the Lord. And everyone who possessed blue or purple or scarlet yarns or fine linen or goat's hair or or tan ram skins or goat skins brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's contribution. And everyone who possessed acacia wood of any use in the work brought it. And every skillful woman spun with her hands, and they all brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. All the women whose heart stirred them to use their skills spun the goat's hair. And the leaders brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastpiece, and spices and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. 
Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord is called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, from the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs for working gold and silver and bronze and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Oholiab, the son of Ahas- Ahasamach, of the tribe of Dan, he has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet, uh, excuse me, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen or by a weaver by any sort of workman or skilled designer. Now, in response to God's commands, the people go out in love and they give freely, contrasting heavily with the early apostasy with the golden calf. What once they gave out of fear and doubt, they now give out of love and devotion. So too are we to do the same when it comes to giving God what's his. What that is, I can't tell you. But I know there is not a single Christian out there called to give nothing back to the church and the people of God so that the gospel can spread. Consider privately with God on your own time what he's asking you to offer And then listen. Now we see the formal call once again of Bezalel and Oholiab to be the ones leading the charge to build what God had earlier described to Moses. These men would use their natural talents and skills to bring the kingdom of God to the people in the physical form of the tabernacle and all the items within it. Recall what we discussed last time when their names were brought up. Each of us has a unique ability that God alone has provided us. So we must utilize them for the sake of the kingdom. If you don't know, that's okay. Figure it out through prayer, speaking with trusted leaders who know you very well and have seen your actions, or simply serve to find out where you fit. I promise you, God has given you something and you must protect that gift for his sake. I'll go from there to chapter 36, verses 1 through 19. Bezalel and Oholiab and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Oholiab and every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him up to come to do the work. And they received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning, so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came, each from the task that he was doing, and said to Moses, the, pre- the, excuse me, the people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave command, and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. And all the craftsmen among the workmen made the tabernacle with ten curtains. They were made of fine twine linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarns, with cherubim skillfully worked. The length of each curtain was twenty-eight cubits, and the breadth of each curtain four cubits, and the curtains were the same size. He coupled five curtains to one another, and the other five curtains he coupled to one another. He made loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain of the first set. Likewise, he made them on the edge of the outermost curtain on the second set. He made 50 loops on the one curtain, and he made 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that was in the second set. The loops were opposite one another, and he made 50 clasps of gold and coupled the curtains one to the other with clasps. So the tabernacle was a single whole. He also made curtains of goat's hair with a tent, for a tent over the tabernacle. He made 11 curtains. The length of each curtain was 30 cubits, and the breadth of each cubit... Me, uh, gosh, dang it. <laughs> I'm having a hard time today. The length of each curtain was 30 cubits, and the breadth of each curtain, 4 cubits. The 11 cur- curtains were the same size. He coupled 5 curtains by themselves and 6 curtains by themselves. And he made 50 loops on the set edge of the outermost curtain of the one set, and 50 loops on the edge of the other connecting curtain. And he made 50 clasps of bronze to couple the tent together that it might be a single hole. And he made for the tent a covering of tanned ram skin and goat skins. The giving of the offering to God was so immense that Moses had to make a command where he told them to stop giving. When was the last time your church had that problem? When people were giving too much? I can't think of a time. And some of that is for good reason. One should only give what God has commanded them to give so as not to ruin themselves. But I would argue the more likely option 
is that people aren't giving what God has commanded them to offer. And look, hey, I'm here amongst you. I know I haven't always been faithful with this command and that he has had to remind me multiple times over that my money and skills aren't mine to keep if he has called me to offer them up to him. But in this specific moment in time, let us see the wondrous example the people were setting up for themselves and their children by offering plentifully to God and his chosen leaders for the sake of worshiping him. Now, what could also be missed here is that Moses and his leaders knew exactly how much they needed so that they could know when they were receiving too much. Churches and Christian organizations have budgets, salaries, and more to worry about, but they should also be mindful of what to do when they receive more than they ask for. Having a surplus and keeping it in, you know, keeping it around in case of emergency isn't sinful. There's nothing wrong with having more than you ask for, but not knowing what to do with it when you receive that surplus isn't a mark of a good leader and is something we should be mindful of. There is nothing wrong with the offering being more than the expectations of what's needed to pay you know, your pastors or your secretaries or to send out to missionaries or what have you. There's nothing wrong with having more than what you've asked for. What's wrong is not knowing what to do with that surplus. Are you saving it somewhere where it's financially smart to do so? Are you investing it somewhere? Are you keeping it and say, hey, I have this idea. We could do this, but I'm going to need to raise the money for it. Well, if you already have the money, all you have to do is say, here it is. Because you were smart with it. So just think about that. Not everyone has to be in a church where that's happening. Because not everyone has enough people in it to where there could be an immense surplus. Sometimes you're just breaking even, and that's okay. Sometimes you're in the red, and that's okay. God's with you either way, if you're doing what he's telling you to do. And we'll finish off today with verses 20 through 38. Then he made the upright frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood. Ten cubits was the length of a frame, and a cubit and a, and a half the breadth of each frame. Each frame had two tenons for fitting together. He did this for all the frames of the tabernacle. The frames of the, for the tabernacle he made thus, 20 frames for the south side. And he made 40 bases of silver under the 20 frames, two bases under one frame for its two tenons, and two bases under the next frame for its two tenons. For the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, he made 20 frames and there are 40 bases of silver, two bases under one frame and two bases under the next frame. For the rear of the tabernacle westward, he made six frames. He made two frames for corners of the tabernacle in the rear, and they were separate beneath but joined at the top at the first ring. He made two of them this way for the two corners. There were eight frames with their bases of silver, 16 bases under every frame, two bases. He made bars of acacia wood, five for the frames of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames of the tabernacle and the, at the rear westward. And he made the middle bar to run from end to end halfway up the frames. And he overlaid the frames with gold and made their rings of gold for holders for the bars and overlaid the bars with gold. He made the veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen, which cherubim skillfully worked into it, he made it. And for it, he made four pillars of acacia and overlaid them with gold. Their hooks were of gold, and he cast for them four bases of silver. He also made a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen embroidered with needlework. And its five pillars with their hooks, he overlaid their capitals, and their fillets were of gold. But their five bases were of bronze. Now, if you're like me, this repeated information it's a description of things you don't normally care about. I'm with you. Let's get through this together because there's something important being done here. And that's the showcasing of the beauty of the tabernacle and everything around it and inside of it. This is something that is wondrous to read of and not something to be feared as a sign of indulgence and luxury within the church. Now, don't get me wrong. You should always be mindful of that. But this specifically is not that. This is not your pastor showing off his, you know, 20 Rolex watches while he's getting onto his private jet while the church itself is like covered in gold or what have you. No, this is not the point of what's happening here. We do need to be mindful that when we decorate our churches, that people will make assumptions about how our money is used if we get too extravagant for our own good. But to go here in scripture, what is happening right now, the whole point of the tabernacle being constructed so beautifully was to show God's love for his people and providing them with such a place to worship. Nowhere else in the world was there a place of worship like the tabernacle. 
and eventually like the temple because none of those other places had God. Now, our churches should serve the same function. Now, I, as mentioned many times before, I am not an aesthetics guy. I, I don't care about color contrasting or, you know, or what, what, you know, I don't know how the pews are arranged or how the chairs are set up or, you know, what uh, do we do we have a, a Baptist flag or something anywhere? As I, well, I kind of do care about that. I think it shouldn't be inside the church, but that's its own issue. But when it comes to the aesthetics of it all, I couldn't care less. That's not me. But thank God there are other people around me who do because those do matter. I just don't think they matter, even though they do. Uh, you don't have to hang along around me to figure out that I'm not really the guy that gets dressed up. But there is something to be said about making a house of God attractive on the outside and the inside so that people are encouraged to worship him. This is not to say you can only worship in a place that looks beautiful. No, there are multiple times over in Scripture where we see people worshiping where they are. I mean, Paul and Silas alone in the jail cell are singing and praising God with hymns. Not exactly the most beautiful place in the world, but for our places of worship, they should be beautiful to point not to the beauty of those things, but to point to the beauty of God. Now, there are plenty of alleged churches out there, and that's probably the most diplomatic way I'm going to put it right now. Who seek to make their own names great instead of God, and they utilize attractive buildings, lights, signs, theatrical productions to make people want to come to them, but that has no place in the church. So be mindful of why we decorate as we do and what that means when it comes to our worship of God. And with that, we're done for today. Next time, we'll be finishing up Exodus and then moving on to Leviticus after that. Looking forward to what's going on. Please get a chance to leave a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice to help us with the ratings there. If you're interested in my own fiction writing, you can leave my excuse me, you can find my works at starvingwritersguild.com or on Amazon by searching for the name MC Ashley. If you're all interested in some further solid studies into the Bible and its teachings, then check out the other members of the Anazel Ministries podcasting network. You can find me specifically on Systematic Ecology, Why I Don't Like, Friday Night Frights, and Some Joyful Noises. You can contact me at letnothingmoviepodcast at gmail.com. I'd like to extend a special thank you to Joshua Knoll for the editing that he does and for the music he has to the podcast. And with all that in mind, God bless you on accordance to his will and not mine. Allow me one more time to remind you, let nothing move you. Hey guys, are you interested in podcasting but don't know where to go? Well, check out Zencaster.com and go ahead and make an account there and use special promo code Let Nothing Move You, all caps. That way you can get 30% off of your next deal to go ahead and set things up so you can figure out how to edit stuff using Zencaster.com to host your stuff to get things done there. So check out Zencaster.com, use special promo code Let Nothing Move You. All right, see ya.